Listen, let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 2 this morning. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 18. <clears throat> and we're going to continue in the series as we go through Philippians. I've, I've called it healthy church, a healthy church. And that's who we are. We are a healthy church. And we're going to see this from Scripture. <clears throat> and starting again this morning from Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you'll shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Father God, I pray your blessing, your anointing on your word, Lord. I just thank you for the effectiveness of, of the word of God that is designed to build us up. It's designed to exhort us and bring correction and guidance in our lives. And Lord, I pray that today would be no exception. Lord, that you would speak to us. That your Holy Spirit would take these words and make them come alive. Make them very personal. That we'd find application this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I mean, I, I love the book of Philippians, the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. But I really like this passage this morning because as I read, I see these high and lofty goals. I mean, this chapter is full of aspiration. This chapter is practically a treatise on the perfect church and what it might look like. And let me offer you a reminder concerning who it is that Paul is addressing here in this letter. As we spent two weeks on this already, and I shared it just three weeks ago, from the first chapter of this letter, this church in Philippi is about as good as it gets. These Christians in Philippi were exemplary in their day, in their testimony, in their behavior, in their conversation, and in their conduct. They were known as being a very loving church, a very uh, accepting church, if you will. And as I had mentioned to you three weeks ago, they're the only church that Paul wrote to that needs not be corrected. It doesn't need to be corrected. And instead, this letter, as we go through chapter after chapter, you'll see, is full of commendation, is full of good words from Paul. And as I would mentioned in, in, that, in, in the pre previous message, Paul's intent in chapter 1 was to encourage these believers who were doing such a good job, who were exemplary in, their, in being a church. He, he is, he's encouraging them to pursue even higher goals. As good as they are, he wants them to become better. And so the topic for my message, title for my message this morning, your bulletin, is, is this enemy of complacency. We need, to we need to work against complacency. And I believe that that's what Paul's message is to this church. Not condemnation, not correction, but just, you know, boosting them a little bit. There is commendation, but still asking them to do more. And in chapter 1, verse 9, he, he told them, he told them directly, to make their love, they already had love one for another, they had love for the world, to make their love abound more and more, he told them. 
That whole first chapter, he commends him. You're doing a great job. You're a great group of people. You're a great congregation. But I want you to make your love abound more and more, to let it increase. Because you see, one of the dangers of having it all together, one of the dangers of doing things right, one of the problems of doing a really good job, a truly wonderful job, is that at some point we can be tempted to sit back. Really. And just kind of put it on, you know, just, just automatic cruise, just letting it do its own thing. And we'll cease, in that process we will cease to do the good things that brought us the commendation and the favor with God and others in the first place. I have always considered complacency as an enemy. An enemy to the church and a, and a personal enemy. I don't ever want to be complacent. It's the opposite of inertia. It's a kind of friction that grinds against us and works against forward progress. Amen? And it's so easy for us, any one of us, at, at, at one time to be diligent in the Christian walk and then later on to get careless and lose the edge. I mean, the Old Testament is full of examples of, of, of leaders, leaders in Israel, personalities who started out well. On Wednesday nights, we've been looking at, at Saul in the book of Samuel. I mean, he started out with all kinds of promise, but over time got lax, he got careless, and, and eventually became outright disobedient to God. Folks, listen to me. We've got to watch out for that gradual slide. You know, when a, when a Christian, I don't, I don't want to use the word backslide because that just sounds like it's, you're at the very end. But there is, there is this, we, we can all begin to slide in the opposite direction and find ourselves in a place that's not so good. And it may seem sudden, as some people may watch you or you've seen others it may seem sudden, but it really is gradual. It really is gradual. Uh, basically, if we're not climbing higher, then we're sliding backwards. I really believe that. I don't think there's any level ground in the Christian walk that we're always to be going higher. And, and here's a for instance. In the book of Revelation, I mean, there are plenty of personalities in the Old Testament, but in the book of Revelation, second chapter, Jesus Christ addressed the Ephesian church. Another wonderful congregation, by the way. It really was in its day. It was, it was an esteemed congregation, and, and, and most commentators believe that it was pastored at one time by Timothy. But here's what we read from that second chapter of Revelation. Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And look at how simple that is and yet how powerful it is. Remember the height from which you've fallen. And then he says, repent, turn around and do the things you used to do. Do what you used to do. That's a good way to come back. You see, folks, we so often, we, we think in terms of black and white. We tend to look at life as polar extremes. We tend to think of bad, of, of, of bad, of something being bad, being the enemy of that which is best. And you've heard me say this so many times in this pulpit, I'm going to say it again. The truth is that sometimes good can be what is working against what is best. It's not bad and best, good and best. Sometimes we can settle for what is good instead of aiming for what is absolutely the best. And, and, and I want us to jump ahead into chapter 3 for a minute, but, and we're not going to, you know, we'll, we'll get there eventually, but I want us just to see how this is a major theme for the Philippian church, because in chapter 3, Paul is again pushing them onward. And I want you to, to, to look at this with me. It's, it's chapter 3, verse 12, 13, and 14. Paul says, not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived, really, I mean, you understand what that means, right? Or I've already arrived at my goal. You know, it's not, not that I, you know, not that I, I've made it already, he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And he's keeping it, you know, he's keeping it vague here. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's pursuing the best. That's, that, that's, that's, that's called being not, not going to be, I'm not going to be satisfied with what is good. I'm not going to be satisfied with where I am today. I think there, there should be a healthy discontentedness in every one of us. 
and probably in every area of life. Whether it be your career and your job, you know, whether it be your marriage, relationships with others, your walk with God. Amen. What a tremendous sentiment. What a tremendous guideline the apostle is giving us here. And, and I even think, you know, and I, I didn't bother this week, but I mean, I've got some things on my resume that I'm proud of, and I'm, I'm not going to, but I'm not going to sit around and just gaze at my resume. Things I've done, things I'm involved with, committees and boards. And even our church praise assembly, we have a wonderful history. But we really don't have time to gather it all up and focus on the archives. And I'll tell you, and that's hard for me because I love history. I really do. I love looking back and boy, how God moved, you know, especially church history. That was, that was somewhat of my major theology and church history in college. And being from New England, I was very proud that the first two great revivals in America happened in New England. The first one was called the First Great Awakening. The second one was called the Second Great Awakening. <laughs> and, they both, and they both came out of New England. And then nothing happened until about 1900. And if God didn't move it all the way across the country to Los Angeles. It's like, really? <laughs> I love history. It'd be so great to be able to take hours and hours and compile things and park them, archive them and have them ready as resources. But you know, we don't have time. We don't have time for yesterday's manna. We can't be reminiscing about the good old days. We can't just be looking backwards. Jesus Christ is coming and he's coming soon. And so we cannot be caught up in the business of reminiscing. We are instead to be in the business of pressing on. And twice Paul said it in, the, in those three verses. He said it twice. But I press on, Paul said, in order to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In other words, God's given me a job. He took, he took hold of me for a purpose, and I now need to fulfill that purpose. I'm going to press on for tomorrow. I'm going to press on for the future. I'm going to press on for eternity. And I will press on in my relationship with God and with others. And I don't know if you notice the flavor of the first verse in the second chapter of Philippians. Going back to chapter 2, verse 1. Paul began by speaking of our vertical relationship with the Lord. It starts there. It starts with our relationship with God. He said, if you have any encouragement at all from being united with Christ and his love and his fellowship and his Holy Spirit, that's where he begins. Take note of that. If you are benefiting right now today from this vertical relationship with Christ, that's what he says, then be sure to make it a benefit to all of your other relationships, which we might consider on a horizontal plane, with one another. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're connected to the Lord and you're in right relationship with him, then let that relationship be used to improve and better all of your human relationships. There ought to be some correlation. And so again, let me, let me mention pressing on and desiring what is best over what is good. You know, it really, doesn't this sound, I feel like I'm being a little nitpicky here because, you know, good is pretty good. It really is. Good is pretty good. But if you had a choice yourself of the best and pretty good, which would you choose? You'd want the best. Come on. I know you would. It doesn't matter what it, what it, it, doesn't matter what it was. If you could afford it, you would get the best. You wouldn't just get pretty good. You wouldn't get okay. <laughs> you know, and many of us, you know, we've got a good relationship with our spouse. We have a good relationship with our family. We have a good relationship with our church family. And it's good. It's good. It's, it's not to be shamed. But might I suggest something here based on this chapter? And don't get mad at me, but based on this chapter, good is really not good enough. Really isn't. We're to press on, Paul said, forgetting what is behind us, forgetting the past glories, forgetting the past victories, even the past failures. We're to desire the best marriage we can have, the best family life, the best church fellowship possible. Again, I believe that we are capable of, some people more than others, I think just comes naturally, that, that we should have a degree of healthy discontentedness within each one of us. To look at where things are and just wondering, can it be improved? Can it be tweaked a little bit? 
there's always more of God to be sought. That's the Christian life. There's always more of him. We can have as much of him as we want. We can be as close to him as we would desire. He won't impose himself on us. But if we, if we seek him, he'll be found. If we want more of him, he'll make himself available. There's always room for more of God. And there's always room for more and better healthy human relationships. And where I want to now focus this a little bit is, you know, in our witnessing. Telling others about the Lord. You know, are we doing a good job? I wonder sometimes. I mean, the church is growing, and we'll cover some of those stats in a little bit. The church, even in America, is growing. But are we growing as quickly as we could, or maybe should? Are we doing as good a job as, as we should as witnesses for the Lord? I, I think there's still more to be done in that arena. And, and when it comes to stats, and I've shared these with you in the past, the Assemblies of God is among the top three fastest growing religious groups in the world. We're the fastest growing evangelical and evangelistic movement in the world and in the United States. The others are not Christian groups. They're growing quickly too. But we are the fastest growing evangelical and evangelistic group in the world as well as in the United States. And I want you to know why this is so. At least I, I want to give you a few reasons why I believe this to be so. Number one, the first and foremost reason that we are growing so quickly is because of God's favor. Pure and simple. Because you can work as hard as you want. And if God's not on your team, man, it's not going to happen. We have his favor. For some reason, we have garnered his favor. He's blessed us and he is blessing us. We are simply in the flow of the greatest outpouring of God's Spirit to ever visit our planet. Seriously. The Pentecostal revival that began in 1901 in Azusa Street in Los Angeles far surpasses what took place in those first two in New England. And it spread worldwide. We're continuing in the greatest worldwide revival to ever come upon man. That's where we sit today. Now, we may not sense that here right now, but when I travel the globe, I see the extension of that harvest. What began over 100 years ago is continuing today. And the forefathers of our movement understood this. It's, it's really amazing. It's so prophetic. You see, when the Assemblies of God was only six months old, in the fall of 1914, we began, we began this, this thing in, in, in April of 1914. But the six months later, there was a second meeting of what they called the General Council Gathering. And they met in Chicago at what was known as the Stone Church. And the leadership of the Assemblies of God, that, that little infant group, drafted what has become a truly prophetic and incredible statement. I've read this to you before, and I'm going to read it to you again this morning. But it said this. It said, as a council, we hereby express our gratitude to God for his great blessing upon the movement in the past. They have six months history, and they're calling it the past already. We are grateful to him for the results attending this forward movement and we commit ourselves and the movement to him for the greatest evangelism that the world has ever seen. We pledge our hearty cooperation, prayers, and help to this end. Now, please, again, understand that the Assemblies of God is only six months old at this point. They began, again, April of 1914 with 300 people. 300 people. Maybe... By the fall, there were another 300. I don't know if they had doubled in that period of time. I don't know. But look at what God has done for a people who have hungered and thirsted for more of God. These people were ready to press on. And we're continuing to grow rapidly. I mean, still growing. In the United States, we're growing at a rate of one new church every day in America. One new church a day. And we've been doing this for decades. We're starting one new church somewhere in the world every 20 minutes of every day. In Bangladesh, I've shared this with you. Love Bangladesh. A deeply Muslim country. There's one new church opening every three weeks. And it's not an easy place. In Nepal, the church has grown from 800 churches to more than 1,200 churches just in the last few years. God is doing some incredible things. I just, last month, I was in Myanmar. Myanmar. Thousand churches. This is, this is a country that was closed off to the gospel for 30 or 40 years. And just with a little bit of an awakening, the church has come alive. 
You see, our movement was committed in the very beginning, as we read, to the greatest evangelism that the world has ever seen. Evangelism is telling others about the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's still happening today. Almost, we have almost 70 million members worldwide. Over 70 million. And that number is estimated to double in the next four to five years. And only one thing can get in the way. Only one thing can prevent this kind of worldwide growth. It's a word that I've already, it's the title of my message today. It's complacency. Complacency is a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. You know, I told you about the Assemblies of God. I want to tell you about another church group that was once the largest evangelical church in the United States. And it also grew rapidly from just a handful of young men, very humble beginnings. It's two famous leaders were two brothers. Both came out of a family of 18 children. That movement grew to more than 15 million members here just in America. But you know, today it's dwindled down to less than half of that. Because, I believe, because they became satisfied with what seemed to be good. They're, they're doing good things instead of God's best things. And the initial fire and the initial fervor cooled off and they lost ground. And many years ago now, one of their bishops, the, the Arkansas bishop, Richard Wilkie, wrote a book. And in that book, he tells us that that movement closes the equivalent of three churches every week in the United States. Instead of adding one church every day, they're closing on average three a week. And he says that this has been caused by a moving away from the fervent foundation of its first leaders. And then he quotes the founding leader. Bishop Wilkie quotes John Wesley, who in 1772 said this, speaking to pastors, Wesley said, it is not your business to preach so many times and to take care of this or that society, society meaning church, but your business is this, to save as many souls as you can, to bring as many sinners as possible to repentance. You see, what John Wesley was saying is this, preaching's good. Preaching's good, it's part of the package, it's, it's necessary. Pastoring a society or a church is good. But getting souls saved is best. Amen. Can you see how we can be busy and we can become preoccupied with what is good to the neglect of that which is best? Okay, and I've given you two different examples here this morning concerning two different church denominations. But we can apply this to all that you and I individually are involved in as Christians. As Christian husbands, as wives, as, as Christian parents, employees, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's desire what is best over that which is good. Let's desire higher ground from where we are even today. You know, let's follow the instruction from Paul to the Philippians in verse 14 of that second chapter. Paul said, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. That's the world we live in right now. And then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Let's give God our best today. Amen? This morning. Now, I'm going to close in a few moments, but with one very important thought from today's message. And here it is. I want each of you to remember, I want you to agree with me that complacency is our enemy. Complacency is our enemy. And all I want us to remember is that our first duty is to tell others about Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, even as employees, even as business owners. That's what we're supposed to be doing. To witness just to what God has done for us. And there are many times, especially on a Wednesday night Bible study, we've talked about this, about witnessing. You don't have to know the Bible from the front cover to the back. You don't have to be a theology major. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. All you have to do is be able to tell people what God has done in your life. That's what it means to be a witness. What does a witness do? They get in the witness stand and they, and they tell what they saw. They, they, they tell what they believe. They didn't have to go to college to be a witness in a courtroom. You're testifying. You're witnessing to what you know to be true. You know, we've been studying the Philippian church. Again, a near perfect church. Definitely a healthy church. This is our third week now. And I've also openly declared to you that 
Praise Assembly is a healthy church. This is a great place to belong. But there's one indication of complacency that we need to reject. We need to more actively tell others about this great church. And not, not because we're great, you know, not, not really bragging about us, but basically we need to invite others to come and experience the best in kids' ministry. Pastor Brandon has shared that during announcements. You know, we need, to, we need to make sure other kids are getting what our kids are getting. And youth ministry, and even senior adult ministry. We have so much quality body, body ministry going on here every week. And, and even outsiders, I've shared with you before, outsiders have told me a few times about our church. They tell me that it's the best kept secret in Delaware. And it shouldn't be that way. We need to change that. Again, there's a little bit of complacency. Because we come in and we enjoy and then we leave. But when we leave, we need to be out there telling others to come and enjoy. I mean, why not if it's really that good? I mean, I think, I, I may be biased, but I, I know your heart. You feel the same as I do. We just need to tell people. And by the way, last week I ran it, but I didn't, <clears throat> didn't talk about it. But in your bulletin, there's two very easy ways that you can tell people about this church. Ultimately, we want them to know about Jesus because you can come to this church. You can be, well, you can't become a member of this church without knowing Christ. But if you could, if you could be a member of a church, I want you to know, it do, membership in a church doesn't get you to heaven. But in here are two ways that you can witness, if you will, very low key. One is grab a bag of the invite cards out in the desk in the information kiosk. Grab them back and just hand them out to people you know. Invite them to church. And the other one is really very simple. We've got a lot of great things going on. They're always posted on Facebook. If you're on Facebook or social media, all you have to do is like it and share it. Just share it. Don't just look at it. Oh, yeah, I'll go to that event. You know, if you've got, I don't care if you've got four friends, if that's all you've got. You've got four friends. That's four people that might need to know. Just do that. Just do it. Take some, what could be easier Really, come on, guys. What could be easier than click? How many are on Facebook? I'm just curious, real quick. All you gotta do, like, click, share, click. Actually, there's another, it comes up again. You have to click it twice. Oh, so much work. <laughs> don't, be, don't take it for granted. Complacency is our enemy. And it's getting harder and harder to tell people about what's going on in here. Do you understand that? It really is. And I just wonder... You know, we get the wrong regime in Washington. We may not, we may lose the right to tell other people about Jesus. That's in much of the world, you know. There are many places in the world where it's illegal to tell people about Jesus. That could happen here. We've got the freedom right now. Problem is, we can't put posters up. And I was lamenting this in our last staff meeting we had. You know, if we have an event coming up here, we, in the old days, we could hang a poster in Acme. You go to your local grocery store and hang posters about Christian events. Can't do that anymore. You can't even go to your Christian bookstore and put up a poster about what's happening at your church because we don't have Christian bookstores anymore. So how do you tell people? You have to tell people. You have to use this. And if you don't use this, use an invite card. Invite people to come to where they'll hear about Jesus where their kids will hear about Jesus, where they might eventually decide to accept him as their savior. You might, you might not be able to pray with them right there. You know, when you walk into the 7-Eleven, you might be able to witness a little bit, but you're, you may not have 20 minutes to explain the gospel. So you can invite them here. Friends, family members, maybe they've kind of drifted away, encourage them. We shouldn't be the best kept secret in Delaware. We need to get the word out. We need to change that. We need to overcome complacency. We need to become a completely healthy church that reproduces believers. Amen? Invite someone to church. Invite someone to Christ. And by the way, you can't invite them to church if you're not coming to church yourself. That's for the benefit of those who might be watching this on the web. <laughs> Make weekly attendance a priority. I, we've actually had people. I've actually, there are people who've actually, they've actually invited people to church. And I've met these people on a Sunday but the people who invited them weren't here. That's really awkward. Make inviting others a priority. The world needs Christ. And you may not want me to put this mantle of responsibility on you right now, but guess what? According to the word, 
You are their earthly gateway. You are their earthly gateway. You hold the keys to the kingdom for people that you know. And you might be the only way that they will hear about Jesus. That's, pretty, that's a pretty heavy indictment. So please do not succumb to the enemy of complacency. Let's continue to strive for more and more. Let's continue to strive for the best, even over the good. Amen.